hello. Uh, just one second. This game. Okay. Hi, this is Franz Cantor here, a cartoonist, illustrator, tune talker. Sorry about that. I was just setting up a live stream on uh, YouTube of all places as well. So we're, you're watching t me on um, on uh, Facebook, and uh, all seems to be good. Just doing. I'm not very good with technical things, so let's try to get through this uh, as fast as we can. I'm doing another caricature today, and um, I thought we'd do it in honor of um, his birthday was yesterday. He's actually a, a, a great. Um, uh, a great star. I'm, I'm, he's a hero of mine. I've, uh, I must confess, I really love his work, his his films. And uh, this is a little thumbnail that I've been uh, working on. But I'll, I'll share with you the subject. It's this guy here, Peter Lorre. So um, you remember his face. You'll certainly remember his attitude, his performances, and his uh, his voice, which are very iconic. So he was in a lot of films. Uh, let's see if I can find that wiki page. And uh, we'll start with, uh, uh, here it is, yeah. So, uh, Peter Lorre was uh, born in, um, in Hungary and uh, in 1904, died in 1964. So he was quite, um, quite young, he was only 60. Um, and uh, he starred in a lot of films. First, first and foremost, when he went to Germany, he escaped Nazi Germany in the 30s but uh, he made a film with Fritz Lang called M which you really should see it was quite an extraordinary performance um, then he went on to star obviously in in a lot of films like uh, Hitchcock's The Man Who Knew Too Much Mad Love Crime and Punishment in America uh, played Mr. Motto Japanese detective in in uh, a B series of films uh, from 1941 to 46 he worked for Warner Brothers and he played, um, uh, uh, what was it? Um, he played alongside uh, Sidney Greenstreet and Humphrey Bogart in The Maltese Falcon. Then it was followed up in 1942 by uh, Casablanca. And uh, he's been in, you know, Asting at Old Lace, Disney's uh, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. And he was kind of typecast in horror films or comedy horror films of... Um, um, you know, mainly appearing with um, um, Vincent Price. So, and Roger Corman film, sorry. So he was um, very, very uh, iconic. And of course, uh, a lot of people would be familiar with his trope, which is uh, his um, alter ego, I guess, would be, uh, you know, Ren Hoek from the Ren and Stimpy cartoon series in the 90s, the early 90s. So here he is with complete with a fez. So his whole uh, shtick, his whole personality really came from the, you know, the, the um, I think it was Johnny C uh, Cairo, the, the character from Casablanca, where uh, he played opposite Sidney Greenstreet, which kind of looked a bit like Stimpy. And um, there was a scene in the end of the film where he says, you fat bloated lump, you know, and, and it was sort of a really aggressive, uh, funny um, scene which is very reminiscent of, of course, Stim of uh, Ren Hoek um, yelling at uh, Stimpy. So he's a, already he's got this very uh, striking uh, features. You know, the eyes are very prominent. They're very, very large. So we, we've done caricatures before of uh, actors with uh, and comedians with uh, large eyes. Their, their, whole, um, at their whole performance is sort of uh, you know uh, 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 expressed with these two elements, these two very very um, very strong uh, features on their face. This is him as the man of many disguises, uh, as uh, Mr. Motto. This is uh, Sydney Greenstreet and uh, Ingrid Bergman from Casablanca land of fezzes so we'll talk about fezzes one day i want to do some some fez uh caricatures caricatures with uh, people with fezzes 
So his eyes are very, very expressive. And I, I think this sort of uh, expression with the, the eyebrows lifting up, sort of giving the eyes more space to breathe is a, is a very good uh, uh, way of uh, drawing him. This is him, I think, in, I think it was Comedy of Terrors with uh, Basil Rathbone and uh, Vincent Price. So they formed a, a, a good working relationship, had very, uh, you know, they, they worked well together. The, the patter was uh, very iconic. This is him in uh, the Bob Hope film. Um, my f uh, I think it's My Favourite Brunette. That's with uh, Lon Chaney Jr. Uh, I can't remember his name, but he, he was really, really good. That's a really great film. It's full of great uh, performances. This is him in an iconic uh, pose, iconic expression, with a fez, of course. This is with Vincent, I think Comedy of Terrors. Or it could be The Wrong Box or something. Uh, oh, no, no that's, the, that's The Raven. That's from The Raven. Here he is again. So very expressive eyes, very expressive eyes. This is him with a, a bunch of recognizable people. Um, Bella Lugosi and Boris Karloff. Very, very creepy. This is his, uh, there's a life mask of him. So it just shows you where the positions of this is very, very prominent. The eyes have kind of um, moved down the skull a little bit. So they're sitting lower in the sockets over here. This is a lot of um, material, a lot of uh, flesh above the, uh, the eyes. So the, the geometry of the face is quite, um, quite unique. Very interesting. There's Mr. Motto again. Mad Love. <laughs> this is uh, Johnny Cairo from um, Maltese Falcon. Okay, so uh, let's get into it. We've got uh, a few minutes. Um, I'm going to work from this, uh, this photograph because I, I kind of like the the expression on that and I've had a, a, a think about the thumbnail so I just um, dropped it I um, I think what we'll do is we'll try and he's got like a little upturned uh, mouth in this this uh, photograph which is kind of nice so we'll play around with some forms just to keep them quite simple And this is the thumbnail, which I'm just trying to work out what I'm going to be doing with the shapes here, you know. So I need to, the eyes are going to be a big feature, probably make them bigger. That would be good. That kind of looks like him a little bit. No pressure, of course. <laughs> um, so the... This uh, uh, shape of this face, it's kind of favoring a more of a, a circle, but um, I, I have this belief that, um, especially with, um, with people who have these uh, expressions, there's a lot of power in their head, a lot of thoughts and feelings and things. So there's a lot of uh, energy or, or um, information that comes into their face from their thoughts. So that's why I tend to make the head quite large. Doesn't always favor, you can't, it's not sort of a general rule of thumb, but uh, it's, it's kind of a nice thought, I think, thought pattern to go through when you're drawing somebody, somebody's face. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is that the lighting is pretty much overhead. So we're probably going to look at uh, shading down the bottom part of the figure of the sorry the face the other thing to remember too is this zone here which i like to call the mask area because it looks like the 
really, like a Mexican mask, Mexican wrestling mask, a luchador mask. This area contains the eyes, the nose, and the mouth. Now, the relationships between all of these elements on the face are the things that kind of give us clues as to who they are. So it's a recognizable um, attributes to drawing the head, drawing the face. So we're not drawing a portrait, we're drawing a caricature. So we're kind of exaggerating a lot of the proportions here, uh, which goes in line with uh, the whole idea of my belief in a caricature is giving you the ability to exaggerate um, and to simplify. So you simplify things by creating a shape that you can contain all of these details in something simple that you can access immediately and get drawing. Um, the, and, and of course, exaggeration because you're changing the rules, the proportions, and uh, the, el the, um, the a lot of the relationships between the elements of the face and the mask area are, um, are a continuing process of a dialogue between balance and imbalance. Okay, so I've taken the, this uh, pencil sketch and uh, this thumbnail and I've kind of mapped out where I want to go with the drawing on uh, the page up here. So um, let's, uh, let's, get, let's get busy. Okay, so um, he's a very, uh, as I said to you, like you, you can't really um, watch horror films or the history of horror films without, uh, you know, somehow coming upon um, Peter Lorre. And of course, I also love uh, film noir, which is sort of, the, you know, the, the gumshoe detective dramas of the 40s and 50s. And uh, Maltese Falcon is a great uh, uh, example of that. He's got a very iconic uh, voice and uh, attitude. I really like him when he gets excited and angry, you know, because he, he gets, he just sort of lets go. And it's, it's, it's really nice to see because it's, uh, it's like a, a, an explosion that happens in such a small confined space. Because he's quite, he's smaller than, than, you know, the other stars on the, on the, on the screen. And uh, like drawing him like this is really, you know, it's, it's a fun thing and I, I guess you can't help but put on a, a little voice when you're drawing this uh, this character here because he's he's so important it's a great uh, you know it really makes those um, characters shine like they're really you know when you see um, uh, his performance in uh, Maltese Falcon, for example, um, it's really interesting. It's very, very. It's like instantly iconic. You know, it's um, really well thought out and and uh, executed. I think it's not so much believable either because the characters are quite co comic compared to, say, um, Humphrey Bogart. You know. So they're very uh, sort of, you know, obviously it's a crime drama, it's a film noir. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's a descent into the darkness of the underworld. Death and destruction await the hero. I've put a fez on him only because I think it kind of uh, suits the, um, Suits the character a little bit. We'll see anyway. Um, it might uh, might come undone. Who knows? You know, because it's a live drawing, anything is possible. It could uh, it could be a disaster. It could be a disaster. We don't know. So of course, when Ren and Stimpy was on TV um, in the nineties. Um, 
was voiced by uh, the director John Chris Felucci at first, and then the, um, when he left the production, it was uh, voiced by Billy West, who did the voice of uh, Stimpy. Stimpy's voice was based on Larry from the Three Stooges, so it had a very um, gentle, soft, uh, mushy voice. Okay, this is good. So far, so good. Um, I think what we might do, yeah, we'll continue with the hair down this part. Why not? Why not? Just see what happens. We don't know. I don't know what's going to happen, really. Uh, I'm just trying to, because I'm moving things around, you know, I have to sort of uh, make allowances for those moves and where things can possibly fit into the new um, the new uh, paradigm the new way of uh, I've you know mapped out the feet the face the features so caricatures are, are, are you know they're very exciting I think they're very exciting to do I um, I enjoy the challenge you know and you have a different approach every time so there's no sort of template or, or standard thing. And, and quite honestly, sometimes, you know, faces can elude you, likenesses can elude you. Um, it, you know, it's just one of those things where, you know, sometimes you should have taken that left at Albuquerque, you know, and uh, um, instead of uh, making a wrong turn and ending up in the desert. So, 1930s is when he kind of uh, started uh, his um, career uh, in film, and of course he, you know, made 1920s, uh, 1930s, 31 I think was in, so he, he made a big impression. And of course, then there was Second World War, so he had to he had to beat a hasty exit from Germany because he had Jewish parents or Jewish uh, background and uh, <clears throat> that wasn't a, a safe thing to have in, uh, in Nazi Germany at the time. So a lot of uh, actors came to America with this, you know, really great sense of craft and they uh, changed uh, not changed but uh, 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 created because there wasn't really a, a like a, a strong craft to the film business in Hollywood before they came it was a it was a business but it was more like you know Keystone cops or something it was like a it wasn't a craft it wasn't sort of a artistic f um, so much of an artistic uh, pursuit so they changed that and was you know it was still early enough film was early early days so um, you know obviously they had a, a, a an extraordinary impact and um, yeah I'm often um, amazed by you know things like the music and the and the writing um, I was watching the Wolfman is a universal film uh, with Lon Chaney Jr. Uh, just last night and Kurt Siedemack did the the, the, um, the screenplay so um, you know these are artists that uh, and, and creatives that came from from Europe and gave uh, really with the, the case of Universal Studios anyway um, it gave it a sense of of art and and prominence, I guess, in the medium, which hadn't really existed before. So that was really interesting. Um, you know, I mean, when when you're dealing with uh, a, a, an, a genre like horror film, for example, um, it's really there's there's a lot of things to consider. It's a it's a you know, it's a tale, and uh, it's all based on the timing and things like that. If, if it's going to be scary, 
um, but there's also that gothic element to it to the the romantic uh, part the romantic notion of um, the settings the time you know the the, the characters the in the case of the Wolfman, you've got uh, Lon Chaney Jr. is a a um, tortured soul, so and it shows obviously in his expressions, in his eyebrows, etc. So it's a very um, very interesting story. So film had like a, a integral part of the building of these legends, horror legends like uh, the vampire and the werewolf. You know, silver bullets are the way to dispatch a werewolf, um, or you know, <laughs> a silver-handled uh, uh, walking stick, uh, which they also funnily also added. You know, like a as a as an added uh, thing. You have to have uh, a werewolf can only be killed by one he one who loves him the most, and even then by they have to have a uh, they have to be killed by a silver bullet or an, a silver blade. Where would you have a silver blade? Uh, or um, a silver handled walking stick, just because the character was happened to have a silver handled walking stick at the time. So they just thought they'd added that as well. So um, it's really interesting, very interesting face here. I'm, I've moved a lot of the things. I've taken for granted that the eyes are going to be a massive feature here. And I don't know whether this is like Marty Feldman, whether I, I presume that this is, a, this is like a medical condition perhaps. Um, but nonetheless, you know, it's something that he used in his performance, obviously. So you've got like this incredible, um, these incredibly watery eyes that, that sort of, uh, you know, really, really, um, take over the screen when, they, when, they're, when, when you see them. So I'm favoring, I'm looking at the reference and I am putting in a lot of the details into the new shape, into the new areas, the new position that I want. There's also a lot of textures which I need to sort of make sure that I get as well. Um, these are presumptions. I mean, his face is very iconic. You know, there is, um, apart from Ren Hoek, there are, you know, caricatures of him dating back to the 30s uh, Hirschfeld and uh, I think there was also uh, there was also Warner Brothers cartoon he's been featured a lot you know he's a very famous his characters formed a, a trope you know um, even the mad doctor type of thing in, from Bugs Bunny which is based on him um, that's the movie with uh, I think it with uh, Gossamer, the big red monster. Or it could be an earlier one than that. That, that might actually be the Dr. Um, Jekyll reference. So many mad doctors. Let's try to clean up his uh, sclera, this white of his eye a little bit, just a touch. Um, So I'm using the brown pencil to create the form to try to um, not so much, well, I'm starting with the details, but I'm, I'm really building up a relationship between, you know, using the gray paper, obviously the toned paper, but just it helps build up a little bit of a, a relationship with light and dark. So I'm trying to do that, and obviously I'm going to be using like a black pencil for a lot of the details, probably starting with the pupils, which are definitely going to be black. And uh, going around, maybe, the, you know, eyelashes next and 
perhaps the uh, some of the some outlines. I'm not going to outline everything, but uh, I will be outlining some things. Now, when you work from photographs, you've got to. There's a point where the photograph stops, the the reference stops, and doesn't give you enough information with for a drawing, perhaps. So rather than draw, relying solely on the photograph, it's a good thing to think about what you're drawing, right? And how's the what what are the rules uh, associated with that that subject, like the eyes, for example? You know, it they're trying to be uh, a, a bulging out of the face out of the skull and a lot of these uh, these features then throw shadows remember because we're looking at putting the light source from above so anything underneath you have to create a believable uh, effect of light and shade so that's important and you know look into the details a little bit as you don't have to go berserk with with the amount of detail it's up to you i don't have the time to do that certainly a little bit helps here and there you know why not look at the texture light and dark um, the texture is like some elements of the face are shiny some are matte some are light some are dark some are smooth, some are rough, right? So it's a matter of finding that that balance so that the dialogue is is has a sense of uh, the dialogue with a pencil has a sense of um, believability. So there's a reason for these lines. It's not sort of haphazardly trying to find uh, shapes. Well, I am trying to find shapes, but I'm using also. Uh, you know my detective skills to see both what I, what I can from the photograph but also understanding what it is I'm drawing so that I can have um, a more believable uh, effect one of the things that are not often in the photographs of course are these things which are the cheekbones which are very very sharp and they're very close to the skin so most often than not if you were to refer to them like just like so right it makes the drawing pop a little bit makes it seem very um formal very formal in terms of form like three-dimensional so it's an architecturally correct uh, approach i think to the situation uh, do i say architecturally Anato anatomically correct So let's go. We've done that part. Now I'm sort of swimming over to the left eye now. I'm going to try to, to get something in there. I want to try to get make sure that these eyes sort of line up as much as I can. Um, if that's going to work. Probably moved up would be a, a good thing, maybe. We'll try that. So let's try to it's all uh trial and error um i think that might work there's shiny eyelids on here which uh, i noticed in a cartoon of him actually in the 90 from the 1930s um his upper lids are very shiny so i want to try to keep that i think that's a relevant uh, texture that uh I can use that makes some sense it's hard to do to have cut to I I'm I'm of the opinion that this pupil's too big because the pupil on the other eye has got actually a little bit more light in it um, and I can see that they're not that big, they're not that open. So, you know, positioning of the eyes, the line, the um, lining up of horizontals uh, in the face, you know, these are, these are important things to consider. They may not be overridingly 
important to the to the um, recognition of the face perhaps uh, I need a bit more space up here I think so I'll take that back a little bit let's try to get um, I'll use the heavy artillery here we'll try and take it back as much as we can to the gray paper and start that line again there we go how's that let's go so keep these pupils as much as we can these um, eyes as much as we can similar in in size so there's a little bit of a point between in the middle of the uh, the uh, the eye shapes eyelid shapes yep okay I'll leave I'll leave it I, I can't I can't really tell from the photograph exactly what's going on here but um, I'll leave it for now okay good so his eyelashes are not they're not very present in in the photograph but um, I think just to add them in very light detail would be in order okay so he's got these areas of skin underneath the eye that's uh, quite prominent so see that chin that um, line there which represents the, the cheekbone we'll refer to that again it's a little bit of bumpiness here I think that will work how are we going with the nose the thing with the nose is uh, you want to try to keep it uh, round and refer to the under under um, the un the form under the nose with with you know dark slightly darker um, lines so it's not just the you know drawing the outline of the nose it's also understanding that the nose is curves under and then there's like you can put in the shadow yeah that'll do So it's got a, a sneer on the one side of his mouth, which um, I found very interesting, and I'd like to refer to that, which means I'd like to exaggerate it slightly. I think that would be kind of cool. So we look for opportunities to show for, um, form and you know personality, some expression. There's a lot of uh, drama happening in his face in terms of the uh, lines, the presence of uh, where the wrinkles form on the face. It's a lot of, uh, looks like a lot of things have happened in his life. Not all good. So you look for opportunities that uh, present themselves. You know, if someone has uh, a, like a crooked mouth or something, that's that's an excuse to exaggerate it, right? Not not in a mean way, but um, it could add more um, relevance to the face, more 
more it could be more believable um, don't forget the shadow is different to the form of the, the lips too that's the uh, there's an under shadow is coming down from this direction so I'm trying to um, keep it real as much as I can I guess that's all right hmm so he's got like shave burns looks like even from the black and white photograph and his uh, chin It's got a nice curve to it, isn't it? I like that. It's a sort of a nice bulgy effect. I'm giving him kind of a smoking jacket um, over here. It's just got like a quite a large throat sack. <laughs> I don't know what you'd call it. Um, so we'll just do that. We'll keep that at the dark. I think that makes sense. Give him like a cravat type of scarf that they put in the smoking jacket. And you get the overall shape of the, the jacket form. That'll do. Put in the little name ribbon. Clean that up a bit. That'll do. That's fine. Okay, so um, going in with a black pen, black uh, pencil. So um, I might actually need to refer back to the the black pen as well, or black brush, uh, somewhere in in the mix. I just realised too. I was taking I was taking liberties with the darkness of his irises but they're not that dark they're quite I don't know what color they are but they're definitely not not uh, chocolate like mine so I've got to be very careful how much shadow I put in there so I'll be careful I've got to watch my step here I've actually seen quite a few of his uh, films recently. Um, believe it or not, the first time ever I saw Casablanca um, a couple of weeks ago. I'd never seen it before. I don't know why, just, you know, you get interrupted, don't you, when you watch films. Um, I never watched the whole thing, but uh, I did watch it um, several weeks ago and, uh, you know, I've, I found it really interesting, actually. Um, all of the uh, performances were, you know, pretty cool. He played a smaller role. I think he gets killed from memory in the film. Uh, he plays a smaller role. They're all sort of like on the running from the Nazis in the film. They're tr desperately trying to escape. So you've got all these people that converge on Casablanca and and Rick has to uh, solve their problems. So I am, I'm not, I'm trying not to make things up with this, but I, I am referring to the photograph in terms of details and things, but I always filter it with, you know, knowledge of anatomy and light and dark, light and shade and, and form. 
so it's it's a it's a matter of like re referencing things constantly and having them make sense and if they don't make sense then you're sort of left with a don't touch it until you make sense with it you know it's sort of a uh, an indicator that something's not right with the photograph um, if it doesn't make sense there's something you're missing so slow and steady wins the race I think pencils are great for hair you know um, pens are good too but uh, pencils tend to win the day because you can get very long uh, smooth strokes quite easily remember there's a curve at the top of this fez so that's something that has to be it's an ellipse at the top so you've got to be careful about that part and this is a sort of a, a plated I think it's a from memory I think they're sort of plated like curtain drape cords the tassel I'm talking about of course so each of those tassels is made up of rope annoyingly has texture which you've got to refer to like that hopefully it doesn't take all day uh, if it could do that the other way maybe give it a bit of variety I don't know hmm. all right that'll do Look, we should make these a bit darker. Maybe might be worthwhile. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to work down from the top left. Um, probably smudging all the way, but hopefully, uh, I'll just lean on this. You tend to move the pigment around. With the palm of your hand resting on the paper, so it is quite messy in area. So I don't want it to get even more smudgier. So you got really. Um, I saw um, the Mr. Motto series. I think there's about three or four series of that where he plays a Japanese uh, detective um, it was just be just before the war I think just before Pearl Harbor so it was you know it was a, a thing obviously after Pearl Harbor they probably wouldn't want uh, a, a Japanese detective running around I think they had like a Unfortunately, they had like camps where Japanese Americans would have to be um, set up for the duration of the war, which is it's kind of a terrible thing. But they were, you know, pretty uh, scared at the time. So I kind of uh, I fell in love with um, Sidney Toller um, playing um, Charlie Chan. So I love those uh, films, the detective films, the whodunits. And I had a friend send me a DVD of uh, Mr. Motto, and I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a fantastic um, version of a of a. Asian detective 
you know, Americanized um, detective story, detective. So it was, it was cool. Working, f you know, traveling around, doing all these disguises and things. Of course, um, He was, he was very, I mean, some of the disguises, you, you couldn't recognize who it was. So usually in the beginning of the film, you don't know who it is. Who's that guy? And it turns out to be him. Alright, so, you know, I'm trying not to outline things too. I think it's important just to give their, their own um, significance if they're... Sometimes they're, it's worthwhile, like, you know, maybe around the nose or something where you know that that nose is coming out, out of space in a more of a three-dimensional uh, approach. So that might be worthwhile. Um, outlining slightly, perhaps. Uh, but generally, you know, just be a bit uh, careful how much you tend to, ex you know, exaggerate with the with the lines, because it's a you're relying not just on the lines, you're relying on the form. So ultimately, it's a it's a balancing act between a linear approach and um, three-dimensional form. Remember I said too also that the eyelids in I think um, a couple of cartoons that I've seen in the 30s had these sort of uh, Dutch window reflections over here and I think it might work if I did that and made it really you know upper lids darker and put in a reflection just my thought I just got a funny feeling sometimes you have to go with your gut feeling you know wrong or right doesn't matter but it's just something I think would be fun in this case so if you're watching this on um, Facebook um, just a reminder that I am recording this live to my YouTube channel, so you can just uh, go to YouTube and check check it out. You can um, I don't have the link here, but you just put France Cantor F R A N T Z, and there should be a live link. We'll fix this up with a, uh, a a black pen in a second to make these stronger. This because black pencil is is good, but it's not absolute black. So we need to get it a bit stronger to help with the contrast. I think. Now looking left and right to the pupils, of course, you know, make sure that you make them the same size. I'm filling out the um, the highlights, uh, the reflections in them at the moment because I'm going to come back to them with a pen with a white uh, pen it should be a lot more striking so um, again I, am I outlining this too much I don't know to be careful because they're not black uh, these they're not dark these these irises it, it's not too bad actually you know sometimes uh, working like this I remember I did one of Graham Kennedy he's got these big enormous eyes and I kind of looked at it and I said well I don't want to do the I think I'll, I'll, I'll take out the outline away from and just have it sort of very lightly uh, you know um, formed against the the white of the eye so I'll bring up the the contrast with with the pencil white pencil later on uh, let's go back to the black pencil so I took away the outline that's what I meant 
so I, I've just reduced that a little bit and it just seemed to work better I don't know you know as much as I do I'm just trying to do my best and have fun with the subject who knows what will happen I just want to have fun that's all the only motivation for me for doing this it's not a job it's not uh, it's not for anything not for anyone it's for me I just thought about it oh incidentally it's his birthday yesterday so happy birthday um, that's a good enough reason I think I just love these forms don't you it's you know when you find uh, lines and forms on a face it just tells such a beautiful story it's really eloquent um, you know the expressions all expressions come from thoughts and emotions in the mind and they play out on the face so all of these features it's like an orchestra so you've got the the strings the nose what would that be woodwind <laughs> uh, the mouth is very loud so there'll be like the percussion and uh, all of this happens um, really beautifully uh, you know across the face all of these thoughts and uh, and and feelings happen uh, across the face itself and they play out with these instruments these details and they form shapes that continue through time they much like erosion you know like you imagine the the formation of say the great the uh, Grand Canyon and uh, started out with like a, a stream and then a river and then gradually got bigger and bigger and deeper and deeper and got cut into the into the ground into the rock over the millennia and uh, there you have it so this is a really nice ah that's what's going on I just realized there is a um, I just saw the bottom of the the lip here and where it is which means that the bottom of the lip didn't go up quite that much but uh, it's all right we'll see what uh, how bad could it get I don't know yeah looks all right doesn't look broke yet early days though so um, yeah watching him in Rob Roger Corman movies with uh, Vincent Price and that's just a good um, it's a good relationship I think they had on screen uh, certainly came across that way very funny so you know even in um, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea he plays more of a comic character uh, like a, a funny character than a serious character and even going back to say Maltese Falcon um, you know his character is very um, both Green Street and and he had a, a sort of a comic relationship um, you weren't quite sure what their relationship was how are they sort of thrown together what what is their motivations what is their their story why are they together type of thing you know you're not really sure so uh, it's one of the, uh, the things it's not really relevant at the end of the day I think because um, 
you know, however, however they're put together in the story. They're just interesting. That's all it is. That's all you need to know. They're just interesting. They're interesting characters. Interesting rogues, villains. So I'm moving all around this uh, thing, trying to get some lines in there. Very soon, I'm, I think I'll hit it with a black pen, and then uh, we'll start to see a bit of contrast. Just uh, quickly do the jacket, sort of a smoking jacket, silk scarf type of thing. That'll do, I think. That'll do for that. And oh, just fix this up. Oh, and the ribbon. The ribbon needs a bit of sharper definition to stand out. Because I'm not painting that. I'm just uh, leaving that with the grey paper underneath, through it, through the lines. Okay, duck. All right, so let's uh, see where we're going with this. Um, let's see. We'll try to use a brush pen. This is a zig. You can get thin lines and thick lines. The ink uh, is in the handle, and you just sort of squeeze it, and it sort of propagates through the bristles at the bottom. So where are we going to start with this? My goodness. Um, maybe we'll start up here. Let's do that. Let's try to get some stronger definition here. So give it like a combed wetness to it. It's important when you get a brush um, like this, you know, it can be very satisfying because it's quite um, strong in, compared to the pencil, I mean. So it does uh, tend to articulate those black lines uh, a little bit more, giving it a bit more definition for sure. Um, can be quite severe in terms of its uh, its um, definition, its uh, blackness. So, you know, it's definitely something you don't want to be playing up too much because then you just unnecessarily think changing your pencil drawing into too much of a ink drawing and. You know, I didn't want to sort of uh, go down that track. So the the basic understanding, the basic um, reasoning for this, is to help kick up the contrast between the darker elements, so to make sure that they're stronger. So things like the pupils would be good. I won't touch the irises, as I told you before. I might actually outline the nose here a little bit because 
that might help with the creating this three-dimensional property of it popping out uh, what else maybe the lip here that might work balance of course the right to the left eye You always have to sort of be careful of um, how strong you make things. So the idea of this part of the face, of course, is went a little bit thick with this, but it doesn't matter. I'll fix it. Um, the idea is that wet, thick and thin lines, line width for pen and brush, refers to a couple of things. It can refer to, you know, making something stand out from its neighbor or its background. And also to create a somewhat sense of roundness of, of uh, helping the volume work a bit more logically. Because it sort of gives you like a... a um, uh, a, a, a smooth round effect perhaps a little bit this is a theory behind it so there's some black uh, pen I haven't decided what color to make the background yet I won't touch the background yet because I need to work more on the now I've got the white pencil I need to sort of kick out some of these highlights but what I might do is uh, immediately put in the lost uh, reflection oops be careful of smudging. Lost reflections uh, back in the eye. Use also a little bit of uh, shine, of course, as I mentioned to you at the upper lid. So I'll try to get that in. A kind of nice effect. Now there's a bit of shine down the bridge of the nose and breaks here and there for smaller creases that cross over okay so far so good now the eyes the eye themselves it's a bit of wetness here um, there's double wetness here there's a catchment of tear underneath there and then there's a wetness on the lower lid There we go. Uh, oh, there's a bit of shine up there. Maybe put a bit of reflection coming in from the other side of the, the form. It's like a, um, a side light or rim light, whatever you want to call it. Now the lips, of course, have got shine on them. And then there's probably also a little bit over the edge of the lip where it meets the skin there's also like an oil pocket over this part of the, the face under the nose and again under towards the lacrimal of the eye so I'll soften this with a pencil but I just want to um, create some of the uh, a lighter effects I think I might just put a reflection under here um, I know just sort of sometimes you get you sort of go with your gut feeling with a lot of these these things because I'm doing a reflection on that side of the face I might just pick it up on some of these other forms as well Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Careful. So just a very careful. Um, the amount of shine can be um, a little bit overpowering sometimes. You have to pull back. I think less is better than too much, just in case. Hmm. Uh, not too bad. It's got some nice um, reflective reflective lights coming up here and there, which might work. A bit worried about this area, but I'll fix that with a white pencil. So let's. Uh, this is a white pencil. It's a it's a Prismacolor. So it's really soft. Uh, because it's soft, that means it tends to break. So be careful. Um, it's good having a soft pencil because you can tend to work over a lot of the pencil lines underneath to make them uh, lighter and uh, it does have good coverage certainly better than some of the harder pencils like the black is a polychroma which is a harder pencil so all of these are unfortunately pencils come um, you know, the better the pencil, the more expensive it is. So it's, it's a matter of pigment and binder and uh, coverage and things. So you'll find in a, um, you know, it's, it's really up to you to experiment with the different materials. Never commit to a hundred dollar set of color pencils until you play with them and see, you know, if they'll actually consistently provide you with the right sort of uh, effects without struggling you know because there's nothing worse than it's hard enough drawing but to struggle with the drawing to find that the materials are actually not designed to help you um, is you know it's, it's one of those things that really distressing let's see if how much we gain with this so it should be lighter overall this part of the the lower lid because it's quite pink isn't it there's not much pigment in there so get a bit of sharpness here and there I think would be good now this is where the oil collects it obviously underneath the eye so that'd be kind of nice to um, make that shiny as well so the shine is something that you respond to the texture it's a textural thing that you're trying to uh, capture as well as the you know obviously form so um, it serves like a double purpose so the lines are like a hatch formation um, you know, not 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 coloring in so much, except where you want a lot of pigment. Um, it's got these upper cheeks here that are quite quite nice and round. Next to the shadow, there's a pool of light that uh, is quite. Um, Quite dramatic. So let's try to capture some of that drama. There you go. Bit of form. It's not a coloring in exercise, so just only refer to the, the amount of light um, that you can actually see in the photograph and uh, be very careful that you know you don't overdo it because the white, the contrast actually works by having something dark next to it as close as possible. So it gives it sort of the drawing more of a sense of uh, uh, a variety. So 
So try to make the brown, the um, the brown, the grey paper, the mid tone, the mid quality of the paper. Use that for as much as you can for these drawings, you know, because it can give you a very strong sculptural effect, which is what I'm after for for this process. Uh, with little effort. So it's much easier than trying to build up half tone with a pencil on white paper. This actually meets you halfway. So only, you know, be careful how you apply it. Don't color in overall. Just sort of use it as a way of slowly building up form and Rel in, in a relevant amount that makes sense and also um, this doesn't make any sense to me oh well I don't know why I did that but anyway some extra curves in, in the ear that shouldn't have been there but um, I'm not too worried about it. Uh, it can stay. It's quite welcome to stay. So cheekbones, remember those bones are close to the skin. So they would be uh, catching light as well. Um, think of a relevant response, not overdoing the, uh, the, shame, the, the shine and the light. Remember that the eyes, the whites of the eyes, are called the whites of the eyes, but they're not white. You know, they have definition inside. They have like a a marbly sort of uh, um, texture. That'll do. Now we've got to fix some of this because there's a lot of skin that's catching light at the top of his eyes. There's also that, remember that shine area I want to sort of promote too, because I think that might be, a, I, th I have a feeling that that is relevant to this whole facial dialogue. And, because uh, it's sort of stuck out, it's stuck in my head. And I can't get it out, you know. Um, it just feels, it feels right, even though it's not as strong in the photograph, uh, obviously. Let's, what's another pen that we can hit this with? Um, we'll need that for the lettering. Um, what else? Should be. I've got a, another a brush pen. Here it is. This is another Posca. It's an acrylic marker, so it has a brush nib rather than than, than a pen tip, and it has paint that uh, you can pump the, the the back of it. Hopefully, and get some paint out, and then we'll reactivate the hairs on the bristles like that. So that means that you can get a a, quite a variety of stroke. Let's maybe get, uh, might, might be time to put some Brill Cream Shine up here. So far, so good. Actually, while we're here, why don't we just fix this up? Because it's going a bit pink. You know, sometimes the pencil, white pencil, will pick up some of the pigment underneath it and will disturb it somewhat. And uh, may not be a good thing. 
So uh, this is a hot uh, hot area of light. You can see it's sort of a oily texture. So come down to the cheek. We've got a bit of a bulge here which can catch the light. Let's do that. Lighten this area. Go back. Go do the. Make sure the cheekbones working. There's some lines under the the wrinkles going up the side just a bit. Mm. It's a little bit more formed than it should be over here, but uh, I'm happy to leave it at this time. Now, where the skin folds under there, there's a bit of oil, so a bit of moisture or something. So add more shine. There are these um, flaps of skin at the side of the mouth. Do you want to sort of infer too? So, ah, remember the razor bones on the chin. So I'm going to leave some patterns here so that it kind of looks like legit. I could just make it out, but I can, it sort of feels correct in many ways. So this is, uh, this is a scarf. Of course, we can do that lighter. Um, bit of shine on the quilting or the, the um, pillowing of the collar. Let's go back to the white pen. See what we can do with uh, some highlights. Not sure. I think I might do black in the background on this fellow. Uh, maybe. Might be worthwhile. We'll see. Okay, it looks. Yeah, looks all right, I guess. All right, let's get some black. Uh, what can we use for black? Got a thicker marker. No, that's not activated. So this one is activated. So it's got a little ball bearing in it. See, so we've got good coverage, and it goes flat because. Oh no, that one. That's a uniball. This one. No, that's not activated. Where is the bloody activated one? There it is. There we go. So. This definitely goes flat, so let's try to use that in the background over here. Now I'm kind of, I'm going to leave the contours out of this, so I'm going to go right up close to the contours of the drawing of the face. Not so worried about the the border. Uh, I'm going to leave a little gap, and the reason why I'm doing that is because uh, that gap gives you the uh, it's sort of like reinforces the importance of the thick and thin contours that I did around the face so it doesn't change their properties because if you went right up to it you would lose that line it would just get eaten up by the black um, background so this is uh, the cut the the uh, window that I've painted this uh, or drawn this uh, face into uh, provides the drawing with a uh, like a compositional element, like a negative space. Uh, of course, if the caricature was just floating on on the page, there wouldn't be any negative space. It would just sort of it would be um, just floating. So. Composition is a way of uh, forcing the the elements to make some form of uh, contribution to how the eye travels through the through the drawing of what's the hierarchy of the importance of 
relevant elements. And just sense of balance and uh, what else for composition? Sense of balance and uh, contrast, you know, what's important. Light and shade, line. Obviously, it's a very linear approach because it is drawing after all. Um, but this is uh, creating a sense of form. So if you go back to the seven elements of art, there's, there's line, shape, which we've covered, form, tone, light and dark, texture, I'm referring to the texture of things with a shine, and uh, color and um, space there is this element of space because I'm overlapping forms over the over the border a little bit here and there let's go down to the final thing I'll make sure we spell his name right Peter Lurie, happy birthday, Peter, for yesterday. Um, is there anything else I can? I don't know, you know, you, you look at things, eventually you've got to make the decision, well, I'm not touching it again, that's enough. Enough is enough is enough type of thing. So let's, uh, let's agree that that's it now. No more touching. All right, well, that's good. This is uh, Franz Cantor and... Um, this is Peter Laurie, and I will catch you on the flip side. Bye-bye.